Hello and welcome to Lisa Loves. Um, today I'm going to cover a story that I debated long and hard about actually covering as it is quite sensitive. It's depending on how I managed to convey this um, could offend a lot of people but I felt it was extremely important to talk about this. Um, this is going to be about an attempted honour killing in Pakistan. It's very, very unusual for a woman to survive this. And back in 2015, a documentary was made about a young lady that did exactly that. It was actually shortlisted for a bunch of Oscars and it did actually win the Oscar for Best Documentary Short back in 2015. So with that in mind, I felt, to me, I want to cover cases that touch me, that maybe shock me, something that I feel people need to be talking about and to draw attention to. Um, and this is something that I feel we do need to discuss. It is a very sensitive subject. Um, obviously, there's no wish or desire to offend any particular community of people or any religion. But when it comes to this branch of Sharia law, it's something that I feel is disgusting. It's something that I feel does need to be discussed. That may offend some people, but this is where I'm coming from with this. So if you do feel that's something that is not what you want to hear, if that's something that's just going to lead you to want to leave really nasty, horrendous comments below, then this video really isn't for you. So that's the warning up front about this. Let's get on to Saba's story. So the story follows a young 19 year old girl by the name of Saba from Pakistan. As a documentary that I'm going to discuss begins, we see her in a hospital in Gurjanwala. This is in the Eastern Punjab province of Pakistan. And the filmmaker for some time had wanted to actually cover on her killings but but she wanted to speak to and have within the documentary someone that actually had survived an honor killing and that in itself is quite unusual so when she heard Saba's story she was determined to speak to her to get her to be part of the documentary and unusually um, as it's often not the case also Saba was very desperate to tell her story and this is what we're talking about today so Saba was 19 and living with her parents and her siblings, um, happy enough life, normal life, just like any other family. She had actually been dating a young man by the name of Kaiser. I apologise if my pronunciation is incorrect there. Um, they were very happy, they had met a number of times and they were due to be married. But Saba's uncle, on hearing of the relationship, felt that the, the wedding could not go ahead. This marriage could not happen because Kaiser's family were considerably poorer than Saba's family. They were from a, just a completely different social class. And it would be shameful for her to marry someone like this. Um, her father and mother don't seem to have put up any real um, argument before the uncle got involved with this. So the father said to his brother, so who do you suggest that Saba marry? And he suggested his brother-in-law. Now this is someone that Saba didn't know, obviously didn't love. Um, and just because the uncle had decided that this class was beneath her family and she would be sullying the family name to marry Kazir, this man that she loved, she was to be promised to her uncle's brother-in-law. Now obviously anyone from the Western world is extremely lucky in that we marry for love. We marry who we want to marry. I am aware that a lot of marriages that are arranged are very, very happy marriages and a lot of people are very happy with that and in a lot of cases um, are more successful and happier than marriages for love. But in this case, this is not what we're talking about. My issue is not with arranged marriage whatsoever. It's not with that side of things. So just let me get that clear first of all. So Saba and Kaiser, desperate to be together, actually plan to marry in secret, which is exactly what they do. Saba travels to Kaiser's home and they marry. And obviously word of this gets back very quickly to her family who are incensed by what has happened. Her father and uncle come to take her home. Now what happens next is something that I struggle to understand. Obviously I am not from the Islam faith. Obviously uh, my traditions and everything that surrounds how I was brought up is different. I'm not saying it's right and that's wrong but something that is very much revered within members of families that um, usually are behind honour killings or threats to life or sullying reputations of families is their very deep rooted religious beliefs in their in Islam, in the Quran, um, and it's held very, very sacred to them. Now, obviously Saba was concerned because what she did within her community is not something 
that was the norm, that not something you should do. Um, the reputation of the family is extremely important and anything that you can do to damage that, especially as a girl, is, is shameful. Now, her father and her uncle swear on the Quran, put their hand on a copy of the Quran, and they promise that they will not harm Saba when they take her home. Obviously, due to the subject matter of this video, we know that that's not what happened. My mind really struggles to comprehend how they can swear on a sacred Quran, um, something that is everything they stand for, everything that should drive them in life, and they are putting their hand on that book and they are deliberately lying. So Saba's uncle and father take her nearby, they um, shoot her, they attempt to shoot her in the head in the temple. She said she moved her head at the last minute and the bullets just went down the side of her face, but it did show the injury in the documentary and it was quite extensive. It was a nasty, nasty injury. Um, after they had shot her in the head, they put her in a sack and they dumped her in the river. Now, obviously no one's gonna expect anyone to come back from that. Then the father and uncle leave very quickly and go home. Unbeknown to them, Saba's desire for life, Saba's desire to survive, it greatly outweighs her injuries and she manages to get herself free from the sack. This is also all at night in pitch black. She gets herself out of that river onto the bank and she manages to get to a nearby gas station where they phone for help for her, where they look after her until the authorities arrive. As I say, the documentary starts, we join Saba in the hospital um, speaking to the documentary maker about how she feels. Um, it's very clear Saba is a very strong young woman. I suppose for young women it's not really something that is desirable to be very forthright and very outspoken and very strong-minded, which Saba very clearly is. She makes it very clear at the start of this documentary that she has no forgiveness in her for her father or her uncle for what they have done to her. They may as well be dead to her. Um, and not one not to give my opinion, I'm very much in agreement with her with this. When she's released to the hospital, she obviously can't go back to Kaiser's home because she fears for her life, she fears what's going to happen, and she goes and stays with other relatives of Kaiser's. Um, then her father and uncle are arrested. They're put in prison awaiting trial. Now the documentary actually interviews both the uncle and the father, and I, if I could have reached my hands into that screen, I would have done. I was so angry. The father believes that everything he did was right, that she had brought shame and dishonour to his family, that if he didn't do that, he would be seen as a weak man, that he was a strong man, that he was an honourable man, that what he did was the right thing, that basically every right that Saba had was just invalid. It, it was irrelevant. What she wanted was irrelevant. Her happiness was irrelevant. The only thing that was important to her father was the honour of the family and his viewpoint was, did we not feed her? Did we not give her three meals a day? Why should she do this to us? Um, I won't tell you everything that he said in case you want to see the documentary, but I'm sure you get the general gist. Completely resolute that he'd done the right thing. Not, didn't regret a thing, was just resolute that he had done what was right. And the only poor thing about it is that she was still alive. He did say that um, Allah must have wanted to save her. That's why she was still alive. That's something that was to be. That was something that should have happened. But um, he was not in the slightest bit sorry for what he'd done. And he said he was very happy to serve the rest of his life in prison if that's what he had to do, because that was the strength of his convictions. Now me sitting watching this is wondering, where is that conviction coming from when you put your hand in the Quran and, and deliberately lied? It's certainly not coming from a religious viewpoint. Um, he did admit when asked by the interviewer, does the Quran say that you can do this? And he did admit that no, it doesn't. But turned that around by saying, but it doesn't say that my daughter can go and do this. So, you know, it's one of those things people can take bits that they want and use it to their to their own ends, even if that's defending the attempted murder of their own child. So what's next? I find difficult to swallow. Um, Saba very, very clearly and resolutely numerous times said that she did not want to forgive her father or her uncle. Um, she did still have a relationship with her mother, which came later. When asked in prison, the father was asked, how did you go home and tell your wife that you had just killed your daughter? Because obviously they thought she was dead at this stage. He said, 
I am her husband, but she is just my wife, indicating obviously that he was much more important than her, I went in and said, I've just killed your daughter as per my desire. And the wife basically just had to deal with that and be happy with that and accept that and not be angry about that. Saba, when her father and uncle are in prison, is able to return to Kaiser's family and live with them. She's very welcomed, she is very happy there. They are a much poorer family, but they're abundant in love, which is the most important thing. Her husband, Kazir, is so sweet. He said he couldn't live without her. He'd die without her. He, he loves her so much. And they're one of those couples that very obviously was determined to be, and they're very happy together. But at what cost? Now, what comes next is what normally happens in this kind of situation. Saba lives in the same village as her parents and her uncle. Um, obviously, although she's staying with Kazir's family, they still live in the same village. What normally happens in this situation is the victim is asked to forgive the perpetrator and if they agree to forgive the perpetrator they are released from prison, they have no trial, they, nothing happens, there's no punishment and it is a given that that's, everybody goes on as normal and they have forgiven the person that did this to them. Now, Saba says numerous times that she does not want to do this, she does not feel that way, She she's not going to forgive them and I'm with her in that. But it's put across to her that the implications for Kaiser's family as a whole, if she does not do this, are going to be just awful. Now this is a poor family. I would imagine within the community if she refuses to forgive her father and uncle, I don't know what jobs they did, how they worked, uh, you know, they maybe would suffer financially, maybe people wouldn't buy things from them, maybe they would be ostracised, maybe the family situation would get worse, maybe they'd be in danger from other people, potentially it being enraged that she'd refuse to forgive her father and uncle. Now, the person that has the say as to what's going to happen here isn't Kazir, it's not Saba, it's not Saba's, it's not Kazir's mother. It's Kassir's older brother. Because the father, um, father's not in this, I think he had passed on, there is no father on the scene. But Kassir, Saba's husband, has an older brother and because he's the oldest in the household, he's the oldest male, so this is Saba's new brother-in-law. He gets the say as to whether or not she should forgive her father and uncle. Now obviously it's not going to be good for Kassir's family if she doesn't agree to forgive them, although she doesn't want to. And he very much pushes it forward that this is what's accept expected of her, this is what she must do. They must live together in the village and for that to be able to happen, she must forgive them because if she doesn't, who knows what the implications could be. Her forgiving them obviously means they're released from prison without charge and they come out to a hero's welcome, to nothing but respect from the community, that's what's said. Um, so Saba reluctantly must agree to forgive her father and her uncle. She goes to court and she has to stand there and say, I forgive you. She doesn't forgive them. She says at the end of the documentary that in her heart she doesn't forgive them. That outwardly, because of social pressure from the community, she had to forgive them. There was a massive meeting with a load of elders, um, all obviously older men. No woman is allowed to have an opinion about something like this. And they basically say, Saba's going to have to forgive them. This is what must happen in the community for us to continue. And that's what the poor girl's pressured into doing. That's what she must do. So she forgives them. They get out. And her father's swanking about the place saying, I have had so many proposals of marriage for my remaining daughters because now everyone sees me as a man of honour. They have much respect for me. And I'm aghast. This man has attempted to murder his own daughter and throw her in a river and everybody's got much respect for him. If I was a bloke that wanted one of his daughters, I'd be running the other direction. I don't want to marry someone that's got the potential to do that. What if one of the other daughters does something to annoy, to annoy him? He said, and this is after the attempted murder, he said, or maybe it was his wife actually said, if one of our other daughters do anything to dishonor us, they will be beaten, we will beat them and they have seen what will happen if they attempt to, to marry for love. And this is accepted. And my issue is this isn't a matter of religion. This isn't a matter of Islam and the Quran. This isn't a matter of honouring your religion. This is a matter of pure bloody minded pride of feeling that you as a man must have total and complete control over your family like they are possessions to be owned 
which they are not. And if people feel that way, and if people, anybody watching this video feels that way, then you really need education. That That's maybe an unpopular viewpoint among some people. A lot of people feel you have to leave certain things that maybe aren't normal for you alone, and that's how it's done in other places, but no, I'm afraid that there are certain things which may be the norm in certain communities that just is not acceptable in modern life. Anything that involves the removal of someone else's liberty, health, freedom is not acceptable. You know, you could talk about FGM, female genital mutilation. That's normal in some cultures. Is that correct? No, it's not. I may do a video about that in the future. Is honour killings acceptable? No, they're not. Um, they, religion cannot be cited as reasoning for this because nowhere in the Quran does it say that that is acceptable behaviour. And the Prime Minister of Pakistan actually, upon seeing the documentary when it was released, pledged to change the rulings in Pakistan regarding honour killing. And they were changed. The law was changed. But sadly, they still happen today. Sadly, it is all too common an occurrence. And for Saba to have to forgive, even though deep down she didn't, her uncle and father for what they did to her is just... I can't even begin to imagine what those young women go through. Saba has a relationship with her mother. Um, she still has much love for her mother. She goes to visit her. We see the first visit back to see her mother on camera. And although the, the mother stands by the father, which again is something I can't understand. The difference is in that type of community there, there just is no going forward or no life for women unless they agree to respect their husband's wishes and that's what she has to do. And he must be put above their daughter. Um, and I'm sure any of you out there that's parents watching this, um, your child comes above everything else. Your child comes above your partner. Anyone who says their partner comes above their child, I will never understand that. That never will make sense to me. That's not the case for me, that's not the case for my husband, and we're both very happy that each other will put our son above the other partner. It's just almost like, it's like a lioness thing, it's like a lion thing, that's your young, you will protect it at all costs, and to feel that someone could go out there and put a gun to their own child's head because she married the man she loved. Any tradition that's accepting of that, or promote that, or respect that, or honour that, should not be a tradition that continues in these modern days. So that is the story of Saba. There are many, many other young women out there living a very similar life, and unfortunately most of them are not so lucky. They do not survive. But obviously surviving brought with it its own punishment also. She lives in the same village as the two individuals that attempted to kill her. They are being treated like some kind of heroes. The father is saying, everyone has so much respect for me. I don't know whether that's true or whether that's just wishful thinking on the father's part, but he did state that his daughters had had numerous proposals. No, they didn't. He did on their behalf. People that had never met his daughter had felt such an admiration for this honor honorable man that tried to kill his daughter that they came forward and said, I want to marry your daughter. So yeah, I don't understand it. I don't like it. That is the story of Saba. The Girl in the River, The Price of Forgiveness. Um, it's a fantastic documentary. It's only half an hour long. It's well worth checking out, but be warned, it will make you very angry. Um, but this is something that needs to be spoken out about. This is something that needs to stop. There needs to be more rules and regulations in place that are adhered to. And the law should come above community elders. Community elders in these situations seem to think they're a law unto themselves. And how that's allowed, I have no idea. I will say that the police that worked in this case in Pakistan were very supportive, were very decent, and they were men, were very, they wanted her to refuse to forgive them. They wanted to prosecute. They wanted to use this as an example to other men because they said if she forgave them, this would just continue happening. It was a never ending cycle. And she did forgive them for Kazir's family's sake. But you know, not all men out there are that way. It's very important to get that across. These policemen had a lot of respect and a lot of dogged determination to prosecute these men. Unfortunately, their hands were tied and they couldn't. So let me know below in the comments your viewpoints. How do you feel about this? Do you feel it's something that should be left alone and it's something from another culture that's the norm that perhaps maybe just is different to us, but we should accept that? Or do you think this is just abhorrent and everything should be done to just get rid of this tradition, to just punish the people responsible? 
I'd be really interested to know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching. If you're new here, I would love for you to subscribe and I look forward to speaking to you next time. Over and out, family.